Let's hear the first one, Night Fears. The coke brazier was elegant enough, but the night watchman was not, consciously at any rate, sensitive to beauty of form. No, he valued the brazier primarily for its warmth. He couldn't make up his mind whether he liked its light. Two days ago, when he first took on the job, he was inclined to suspect the light. It dazzled him, made a target of him, increased his helplessness. It emphasised the darkness. But tonight he was feeling reconciled to it, and aided by its dark, clear rays, he explored his domain, a long, narrow rectangle, fenced off from the road by poles, round and thick as flank posts, and lashed loosely at the ends. By day they seemed simply an obstacle to be straddled over, but at night they were boundaries, defences almost, at their junctions where the warning red lanterns dully gleamed. It bristled like a barricade. The night watchman felt himself in charge of a fortress. He took a turn up and down, musing. Now that the strangeness of the position had worn off, he could think with less effort. The first night he had vaguely wished that the no thoroughfare board had faced him, instead of staring uselessly up the street. It would have given his thoughts a rallying point. Now he scarcely noticed its blankness. His thoughts were few, but pleasant to dwell on, and in the solitude they had the intensity of sensations. He arranged them in cycles, the rotation coming at the end of ten paces or so, when he turned to go back over his tracks. He enjoyed the thought that held his mind for the moment, but always with some agreeable impatience for the next. If he surmised there would be a fresh development in it, he would deliberately refrain from calling it up, leave it fermenting and ripening, as it were, in a luxury of expectation. The night watchman was a domesticated man with a wife and two children, both babies. One was beginning to talk. Since he took on his job, wages had risen, and everything at home seemed gilt-edged. It made a difference to his wife. When he got home, she would say, as she'd done on the preceding mornings, "'Well, you do look a wreck. This night work doesn't suit you, I'm sure.' The night watchman liked being addressed in that way, and hearing his job described as night work. It showed an easy, competent familiarity with a man's occupation. He would tell her, with the air of one who had seen much, about the incidents of his vigil, and what he hadn't seen he would invent, just for the pleasure of hearing her say, "'Well, I never. You do have some experiences, and no mistake.' He was very fond of his wife. Why, hadn't she promised to patch up the old blue paper blinds used once for the air raids, but now somewhat out of repair? He hadn't slept well, couldn't get accustomed to sleeping by day. The room was so light. But these blinds would be just the thing, and it would be nice to see them and feel that the war was over and there was no need for them, really. The night watchman yawned, as for the twentieth time, perhaps, he came up sharp against the boundary of his walk. Loss of sleep, no doubt. He would sit in his shelter and rest a bit. As he turned and saw the narrowing gleams that transformed the separating poles into thin lines of fire, he noticed that nearly at the end, just opposite the brazier, in fact, and only a foot or two from the door of his hut, the left line was broken. Someone was sitting on the barrier. His back turned on the night watchman's little compound. Strange. I never heard him come, thought the man, brought back with a jerk from his world of thoughts to the real world of darkness on the deserted street. Well, no, not exactly deserted, for here was someone who might be inclined to talk for half an hour or so. The stranger paid no attention to the watchman's slowly advancing tread. A little disconcerting. He stopped. Drunk, I expect, he thought. This would be a real adventure to tell his wife. I told him. I wasn't going to stand any rot from him. Now, my fine fellow, you go home to bed. That's the best place for you, I said. He had heard drunk men addressed in that way, and wondered doubtfully whether he would be able to catch the tone. It was more important than the words, he reflected. At last, pulling himself together, he walked up to the brazier and coughed loudly. 
and, feeling ill at ease, set about warming his hands with such energy he nearly burned them. As the stranger took no notice but continued to sit wrapped in thought, the night watchman hazarded a remark to his bent back. "'A fine night,' he said, rather loudly, though it was ridiculous to raise one's voice in an empty street. The stranger did not turn round. "'Yes,' he replied, "'but cold. It will be colder before morning.' The night watchman looked at his brazier, and it struck him that the coke was not lasting so well as on previous nights. "'I'll put some more on,' he thought, picking up a shovel. But instead of the little heap he had expected to see, there was nothing but dust and a few bits of grit. His night's supply had been somehow overlooked. "'Don't you turn round and warm your hands,' he said to the person on the barrier. "'The fire isn't very good, but I can't make it up, for they forgot to give me any extra, unless somebody pinched it when my back was turned.' The night watchman was talking for effect. He did not really believe that anyone had taken the coke. The stranger might have made a movement somewhere about the shoulders. "'Thank you,' he said, "'but I prefer to warm my back.' "'Funny idea, that,' thought the watchman. "'Have you noticed,' proceeded the stranger, "'how easily men forget? "'This coke of yours, I mean. "'It looks as if they didn't care about you very much, "'leaving you in the cold like this.' "'It was true that it had certainly turned colder. "'His visitor had not stirred. "'How I would like to push him off,' the night watchman thought, "'irritated and somehow troubled. "'The stranger's voice broke in upon his reflections.' "'Do you like this job?' "'Oh, not so bad,' said the man carelessly. "'Good money, you know.' "'Good money?' repeated the stranger scornfully. "'How much do you get?' The night watchman named the sum. "'Are you married? And have you got any children?' the stranger persisted. The night watchman said, "'Yes, without enthusiasm. "'Well, that won't go very far when the children are a bit older,' declared the stranger. "'Have you any prospect of a rise?' The man said no, he had just had one. "'Prices going up, too,' the stranger commented. A change came over the night watchman's outlook. A feeling of hostility and unrest increased. He couldn't deny all this. He longed to say, "'What do you think you're getting at?' and rehearsed the phrase under his breath, but couldn't get himself to utter it aloud. "'Do you find it easy to sleep in the daytime?' asked the stranger presently. "'Not very,' the night watchman admitted. Ah, said the stranger, dreadful thing, insomnia. When you can't go to sleep, you mean, interpreted the night watchman, not without a secret pride. Yes, came the answer, makes a man ill, mad sometimes. People have done themselves in sooner than stand the torture. It was on the tip of the night watchman's tongue to mention that panacea, the blue blinds, and he thought it would sound foolish and wondered whether they would prove such a sovereign remedy after all. "'What about your children? You won't see much of them,' remarked the stranger. "'While you're on this job, why, they'll grow up without knowing you. Up when their papa's in bed, and in bed when he's up. Not that you miss them much, I dare say. Still, if children don't get fond of their father while they're young, they never will.' "'Why didn't the night watchman take him up, warmly, assuring him they were splendid kids?' The eldest called him Daddy, and the younger, his wife declared, already recognised him. She knew by its smile, she said. He couldn't have forgotten all that. Half an hour ago, it had been one of his chief thoughts. He was silent. "'I should try and find another job, if I were you,' observed the stranger. "'Otherwise, you won't be able to make both ends meet. What will your wife say, then?' The man considered. At least, he thought he was facing the question— but his mind was somehow too deeply disturbed, and circled wearily and blindly in its misery. "'I was never brought up to a trade,' he said hesitatingly. "'Father's fault.' It struck him that he had never confessed that before, had sworn not to give his father away. "'What am I coming to?' he thought. Then he made an effort. "'My wife's all right. She'll stick to me.' He waited, positively dreading the stranger's next attack. Though the fire was burning low, almost obscured under the coke ashes that always seem more lifeless than any others. He felt drops of perspiration on his forehead, and his clothes, he knew, were soaked. I shall get a chill, that'll be the next thing, he thought. But it was involuntary. Such an idea hadn't occurred to him since he was a child. 
supposedly delicate. Yes, your wife, said the stranger at last. You won't see much of her either. You leave her pretty much to herself, don't you? Now, with these are women, you know, that's a risk. The last word rang like a challenge. But the night watchman had taken the offensive, shot his one little bolt, and the effort had left him more helpless than ever. When the eye doth not see, continued the stranger, a heart doth not grieve. On the contrary, it makes merry, he laughed, as the night watchman could see from the movement of his shoulders. The stranger seemed to have said his say. His head drooped a little more. He might even be dropping off to sleep. Apparently he did not feel the cold. But the night watchman was breathing hard, and could scarcely stand. He tottered a little way down his territory, wondering absurdly why the place looked so tidy. But what a travesty of his former progress, and what a confusion in his thoughts, and what a thumping in his temples! Slowly, from the writhing, tearing mass in his mind, a resolve shaped itself. Like a cuckoo, it displaced all others. He loosened the red handkerchief that was knotted round his neck, without remembering whose fingers had tied it a few hours before, or that it had been promoted, not without washing, to the status of a garment from the menial function of carrying his lunch. It had been an extravagance, that tin carrier, much debated over, and justified finally by the rise of the light watchman's wages. He let the handkerchief drop, as he fumbled for the knife in his pocket. The blade, which was stiff, he got out with little difficulty, wondering vaguely if he would be able to do it, whether the right movement would come to him, why he hadn't practised it. He took a step towards the brazier. It was the one friendly object in the street. Later in the night, the stranger, without putting his hands on the pole to steady himself, turned round for the first time, and regarded the body of the night watchman. He even stepped over it, into the little compound, and remembering perhaps the dead man's invitation, stretched out his hands over the still warm ashes in the brazier. Then he climbed back, and crossing the street, entered a blind alley opposite, leaving a track of dark, irregular footprints. And since he did not return, it is probable that he lived there. Night Fears from L.P. Hartley's collection of short stories was read by Robert Lang and produced by Peter Kavanagh. In tomorrow's story from the collection, Mr. Mariner is looking forward to Christmas Eve when there is an unexpected knock at the door.